Hi, I'm Ryan Azlett, uh, Mixologic. I'm with the Drupal Association. Uh, here to talk about issue workspaces. So this is to talk about how we collaborate in the Drupal.org issue queues. Um, specifically, uh, a way to make them a better place for us to collaborate and how we manage our changes in code in those workspaces, or in, in the issue queues. So first I'm going to talk about some of the existing problems that we have with the way our issue queues work and what makes them less efficient than they could be. Uh, I'll move on to some of the ideal features that we'd like to see in our issue queues. And then we'll look at the possible ways how we can get there, some of the pros and cons of uh, different approaches that have been talked about and discussed. And then lastly, I'll share a possible solution based on research, based on mining all of the conversations that have been happening throughout the years for a way forward. Um, how many of you have worked in the issue queues? Good. I'm talking to the right people. <laughs> um, so I probably don't have to go through how they work now, but specifically, we're in a patch-based workflow, which Patch-based workflows work really well for large open source projects. Apache uses them, the Git, um, sorry, the Linux kernel uses it. Lots of major organizations are still use this because it's a great way for people to condense their change in code and communicate it with each other. However, there are new tools. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There was a quote author that once said, this will be a quote about something by someone. Very famous person. Okay, so the uh, limitations of the current issue queues. First of all, uh, I don't know if my animations are going to work, so bear with me. Oh, there we go. So it's a complex work workflow with many steps. Uh, making a patch, the node that tells people how to do that is 12 steps. If you need to re-roll a patch, that's another 18 steps. And usually when people re-roll patches, they would like to see an inner diff. That's an additional eight steps. So our workflow requires about, what is that, 38 steps of information to just be able to interact with our issue queues. So additionally, trivial changes require the same complex workflow. Every time someone submits a patch and there's like, oh, well, everything's right except just this comment at the top should be this different way. How many people have ever seen that comment and said, hey, you just need to change that, rather than make the change themselves. Like, if you, yeah, <laughs> like, hey, fix that. Because the assumption is the other person has their system all set up and it's easier for them to make the tweak and upload, upload the patch than it is for you to get all set up. Um, so trivial issues such as code standards, cleanup, documentation, fixing, those all get neglected for higher priority issues due to perceived conflicts with other aspects of, especially like in core development, where we don't want patches to interfere with each other. Um, that can make it difficult for learners. So our, our new people that we'd like to bring into Drupal core, they have to learn these, these 30 steps. They have to learn how to work with this patch-based workflow. A lot of new developers are very used to things like GitHub and Bitbucket and all these other workflows that are not patch-based because they've developed after Git has come along and other tools that have made it a lot easier. So um, the other issue that we have is there's no intra-issue visibility. When you have a patch, the only people who know that, oh, well, we don't want to fix that here because so-and-so is working out on, on this other issue. There's no easy way for us to know that if this gets committed, it'll break these five patches. There's kind of an internal knowledge that is tribal, but there isn't necessarily a real simple way to, just by looking at the issue, have an automated way to say, oh, if you commit this patch, then these other issues will be affected, or this issue is currently touching these other issues. Um, so, and that's because patching isn't as smart as something like a git merge. If you use git, you can merge between different issues to find out whether or not there's conflicts. Um, that also causes problems with reluctance to make major changes. Like, for example, there's an issue that's been floating around, uh, issue 7269, nice four-digit issue of let's rename all the files to end in .php. 
and Drupal 5, Drupal 6, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, now postponed to Drupal 9. We can't ever make this change because it would break every patch in the queue because all the patches are expecting the file names to be .module, .install. But because it's a patch, it's really hard for everything else to work. Uh, really, really hard to avoid that problem. And so we have things like disruptive patch windows that we have to wait for for when major changes come through. But with merges, you would be able to merge file renames into a, an existing body of work and be able to say, oh, great, now everything's working on .php files and we don't have those sorts of conflicts. So that's another problem with our current queue. Um, and again, the, the not having this ability means we have to rely on tribal knowledge and, and a very few contributors that can know the large scope of like what things are going to be affected or impacted. Um, patch review. Reviewing these patches can be challenging. So because patches aren't granular, sometimes by the end of an issue, when it's time to fix something, you have a patch that hits 300 files and fixes a lots of different things. And it's not necessarily possible to parse apart what was just tangential to the patch or, you know, it, it can be a really large, large patch by the time all the work is finished on it. And you can't see the granular commits or the granular changes that led up to what that actually became. We also don't have a built-in diff viewer to Drupal.org. It's been implemented externally with Dreaditor, which most of us use, but the functionality is mostly there, but we do have to rely on an external tool. And for new developers, of course, it's like, oh, what, there's a secret tool that we have to use that makes it better? I didn't know that. Um, finally, another issue that I'm, this is one of my pet peeves, is that stale patches happen in the issue queues. There's 14,000 issues on, on in the Drupal core project. There was like 8,000 of them that were marked need to review. All of those patches, somebody really cared about the code that they were submitting to that to that issue. They were like, this needs to be fixed. Here's my idea to fix it. And maybe no one had time to get into that issue and find out, oh, yes, we should apply this. We should fix this. Because the average wait time is about 23 days between the time that someone posts a patch and the time that someone answers that patch. So because of that, by the time someone gets around to looking at it, that patch may be stale. Commits may have happened on head. And that patch may no longer apply. It may no longer. It may conflict with something that got committed. And the person who is most invested in that code that change doesn't get notified when that when their patch becomes stale when they when it breaks. And so six months later, someone might be like, "Hey, I rerolled that patch," and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, that patch that I worked on six months ago. Oh cool, someone's touching that now." You know, it's it. So we have this problem where patches get stale. Nobody knows about it. People have to do kind of grunt busy work to re-roll these patches to make them usable again. And so if you go and look at the issue queue and you look at needs review, it doesn't mean here's a bunch of changes that need review. It means here's a bunch of changes that could potentially need review, probably needs a re-roll, probably doesn't work anymore. I, it, it doesn't give us a nice clean, this is what we're looking at. So what would better tools look like? And this is kind of a high level uh, current state's not ideal, but what would something better have? So since we're using Git, something that uses a Git-based workflow, things that have pull requests, or something that you know would allow us to have less disruption by not having you know, by using a Git-based workflow, we could use patches instead of patches, submit and review and accept work, have pull requests, have forks, have all these things that other places like GitHub or even hosted services have. Um, We'd be able to do merges instead of patch rerolling. Um, it, it lets us avoid the concept that patches are really just an export out of our Git database that we use to communicate, and then we import them back in. We no longer we would avoid that. It would allow us to detect code conflicts and provide immediate notification. So let people know when their patch gets out of date. Let people know that this patch conflicts with other patches, and that can give us a whole slew of benefits like. Um, you would find out that somebody else is working on the same issue, but just in another, or the same problem, but in another issue that you didn't know it existed. We'd be able to commit changes without the worry of disruption. We'd be able to um, move forward on things that were kind of stuck on, that kind of stop velocity. And then we'd also be able to see how different issues affect each other. 
So the tool would also integrate a code review functionality because honestly that's really part of the process. We Someone has a change that they want, everybody else looks at it and says, I get what you're going for, it should be better this way, that could be better that way. There needs to be that ability to discuss code on a line by line level similar to what we do now. And finally we want to be able to have something like an inline editor so that when there is that small fix that nobody wants to roll another patch for, you can be like, oh, I just fixed that for you using just this editor built into the issue. So these are things that we would like to see. That I, I've seen these as problems. There may be others that we're, we're, we haven't covered here, but these are some big ones that I think would allow us to kind of have a higher velocity. And so the constraints that we have that we're operating under is we don't want to disrupt everything. We don't want to just jerk the rug out from everything like, hey, here's the whole new everything. Everyone stop what you're doing and learn the new thing. We want to preserve the way that our community collaborates on issues because right now anytime someone wants to fix something, they open an issue and the conversation all happens and everybody discusses this issue and they figure it out in one place and the community works on a patch together. We, d we don't have a uh, what I think of as a star model where one person has an idea and the maintainer and them work it out. It's everybody works on the issue together. And I think that's part of what makes the Drupal sausage like really valuable. Um, we also want to keep Drupal.org the home of the community. So some of the options and ideas we've tossed around may or may not help with that. You know, it, it, we start to push things in different places, then Drupal.org, the Drupal community can start to fragment and some people will never need to go to Drupal.org because all they do is pull code from somewhere. So it might, you know, that is a constraint. And then we've only got so many resources to make changes in the first place. And so we have to look at how difficult it will be to implement changes and how much of an impact some of these will be. Because there's definitely lots of discussions about why don't you just do this? And oftentimes there are a lot larger problems than just. Okay, so what are the options? Uh, knowing we have constraints, um, this isn't a new conversation. We've This has been talked about a lot in the issue queues, and so a lot of this is like summarizing and digesting all that information and coming out with an idea. So, so we have uh, four potential options. Do nothing. Status quo is fine. We're happy with the way things are. Uh, I, we've iterated some, you know, previously already that, like, that's probably not an option. We could move to an externally hosted service. This is move everything to Bitbucket, move everything to GitHub, move everything to GitLab's new hosted service, let somebody else handle our code, issues, repositories. We could switch to a self-hosted service, things like Fabricator or Jarrett or GitLab on our own infrastructure. These are also options that we could use to tackle this problem. Or we can modernize our own issue queues, fix them in such a way that we're used to working with them with and try and reduce impact. So let's let's look at each one of these. So doing nothing. Let's keep our tools the way they are. Now, I've already talked about some problems and I saw some heads nodding that like, yeah, those seem like problems. Um, I think I saw some agreement anyways. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Any changes will break someone's workflow. Um, we don't think this is an option, but we keep hearing from throughout research, throughout all the issue queues that keep coming up, throughout all of the um, all the people that are experimenting with other options, or even people that have moved their stuff somewhere else, or people that are like, well, I'm using Hubdrop to mirror all my projects on GitHub, and I don't have to worry about Drupal.org's Git anymore. And so people are definitely looking for other options because they're not happy with what they have. So option two, move to a hosted service. Things like Bitbucket, or GitHub, or GitLab. So these are these hosted services are awesome. Lots of people use them. We've looked at them and you know they may or may not be appropriate for what we're doing. So one of these hosted services I want to talk about in specific is GitHub. And I want to talk about their data model and their workflow and how we don't think it necessarily applies to the way Drupal builds its products or its code. So you have code changes on GitHub that are pull requests. Both pull requests and issues have comments on them. So you can start an issue, start commenting and tie a pull request to it. But that pull request can also have comments on it. And then if that pull request isn't quite right, someone says, oh, well, I like your approach, but I don't know if that's the way we want to do it, then someone has to fork that pull request and create another stream of comments. And then if a new contributor comes in and is like, hey, I want to help them with this issue, where do they go? Where do they look for the canonical 
discussion of what's happening with this code change. Convention says, well, we just keep everything in the issue and never comment on pull requests, but if people can comment places, they will, and so it's, it's kind of fragmented. And so what ends up happening is forking a pull request forks the conversation. We end up with conversation in multiple places, and it will just kind of break down the way that we communicate. So Drupal's, on Drupal.org currently, our code changes or patches, they live in comments on issues, and if someone else wants to work on the same code, they create another patch. And it, all the conversation happens in one place. And so that, to me, is the fundamental difference between what we've got already and what GitHub could offer us. And I think these are the same issues with Bitbucket and with uh, the other hosted data models. So some of the hosted you know, services wins and fails. Moving would be really disruptive. We'd have to tell everybody, hey, everything is moving over. All 27,000 of our repositories no longer live on Drupal.org. They're on GitHub. Here's, here's your new account. And of course, there's account issues of like, well, how would we manage logins and who has access to things and all. There's just, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that we need to consider there. It would break the collaborative model of our coding, which again, I say is basis of our community. Drupal.org wouldn't be the place where everyone goes for code. They would be going to GitHub and it wouldn't necessarily be here's the Drupal section of GitHub where you can walk around and see other modules and find other pieces of code so that you can look for examples of an implementation somewhere else in the code base. It would be spread all over GitHub, so it would be a little harder to find your way around. And finally, like, like I said before, this sounds easy in theory, but the sheer amount of work of moving everything over to something like that requires a lot of API integration, requires a lot of thought, a lot of design, a lot of how would this really work if we were to try to do this, and it's not simple. So what other options do we have? Well, let's, let's move it to a self-hosted service. Let's turn on Fabricator, or which is what Facebook built for their code review and code tools, and it's open source, or we could use Jarrett, which is the, um, it, it, it's another code review tool that I haven't had much experience with. There's several of these that we could use that could mirror our Git repositories. Uh, Fabricator, yeah, that's, that's Diffy, the Kung Fu review cake, cake, uh, cuckoo from Jarrett. Um, we could use that Lassian stuff, but it runs on Java, so <laughs> takes a little while. <laughs> Um, so what would happen if we did that? So we've got some software, uh, self-hosted art software, some of the wins and fails that we've seen in a lot of the discussions that came up were that, you know, the data models might not be that different, so we could potentially keep the collaborative model that we have, but we would have to evaluate these other code bases to the nth degree. The code bases might be in, they might be open source, but they might be Java, and we don't have Java resources on staff to help manage or maintain it. Um, security updates to this software would be something that we would have to handle that's kind of outside of what we're used to dealing with as far as like, well, we know Drupal and we have people looking at Drupal and this is an external piece of software that like, what if there's a hole in it? And then we're just at the mercy of whoever's looking at that code for us. Um, an advantage though, self-hosted means we own the data. Um, it would still be disruptive. Like you'd still be like, here's the new thing and everyone stop what you're doing and move on to this new tool. So we definitely have um, resource requirements, like we'd all have to learn this new piece of software. We'd all have to figure out how it, to administer it and implement it and configure it. And so those are some of the yeah, self-hosted wins and fails. There's um, a lot more discussion on this on various different spots in, on groups.drupal.org, and I've got some links in the slides once I put these online. So Okay, so finally the last issue is, or the last option is modernizing our issue queue. Taking what we've already got built and moving it forward just enough that it actually satisfies some of the needs and some of the pain points that, we're, that we have right now. So we want to level it up. <laughs> um, we all get flaming swords? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if that's a feature or if it's a feature request at this point. Okay, so this has been talked about before. There, when we were all talking about moving to Git, we were saying, oh, the phase three of the Git, great Git migration will offer 
per branch issues and or per issue branches of core. And there was a lot of ideas and a lot of things that were happening around that. What we'd have to do is add new features to the existing issue queues um, and the Git daemon itself. We'd have to add things to that to support what we'd want to change. Um, this would provide minimal disruption. We, the issue queues would still be somewhat the same. There would be new features added, but we would try and preserve exactly what we have now so people could gradually move over. And we'd want to preserve, this would preserve our collaboration issues. So we would still be working in an issue. We, people would still be doing things the way they are used to. It would keep Drupal.org at home in the community. And this is achievable given the resources that we have. Now we have a tech team of 11 people. There are people who can dedicate enough time to this that similar to the way people put time into building the Git infrastructure in the first place, we have some resources that are able to do this. So what is the proposed solution here? Issue workspaces. So issue workspaces, it's a new way of working on issues that use some of the underutilized features of Git that allow contributors working on an issue to use the power of Git to manage change. Very similar to per issue repositories, like a, but it's more like a per issue fork of the main repository. The feature that allows issue workspaces to work underneath the hood is a thing called Git namespaces. Basically, Git namespaces is a logical separation on the server that would allow us to have separate branches, heads, and tags in its own namespace, yet all share the same repository on the server. So you'd have one really big repository, which would each issue would have its own, like a fork of the repository, and it would have access, but then merging back and forth in between um, these workspaces would be really easy and be able to use Git to do it. So let's, let me go into a little bit more detail. So there would be one namespace per issue. So once you open an issue, if you decide you want a namespace for it because you're going to do code changes, you'd create a namespace. This namespace would have a per user, per issue protected branch in that namespace that only that user can push to. So you're kind of like the maintainer of your own branch on that issue. So you'd have a branch that you could commit to that nobody else would be able to push stuff on top of. You wouldn't have to worry about having to catch your code back up. There would be a branch pointer so that there would be something called latest. Just like you could do git pull head, you could do git pull latest, and whoever was working on that issue last, you would be able to use that as a convenience method so you wouldn't have to go and find out git hashes each time. You could say git, git merge latest from whoever else was working on this issue. And then any number of shared branches could that anybody could have access to can be in this namespace. So you'd create an issue, four people are working on it, there'd be four branches, one for each of those users, they would each have access to those branches, and then there'd be a shared one where if they want to like merge back and forth, and they don't want to just work in their own spaces, that would allow for those sorts of uh, collaborative efforts. So with Git, it kind of gives us a lot of options, a lot of choices on how we could work with this. So that's issue workspaces in a nutshell. So it gives us our Git-based workflow. You know, the contributor would clone the workspace, which would be a button on the um, on the issue itself, where much like on GitHub, when you want to clone a repo, there's a button that says, "Here's here's the string you need," or just like on our reverse revision control tag, and it would be git clone your name at git.drupal.org project slash drupal slash issues slash issue number dot git, and the server would be able to translate that into the namespace. So locally, it looks like you're working on a copy of drupal.org with your separated branches, but on the server side, it would be um, it would be connected to the main master repository. So the user would make changes to the code, they'd make their commits, and they would push. So this push would, um, you wouldn't need to do commit, or you wouldn't need to create patches anymore. You'd be able to just push back up to the repository. Those changes would happen in the issue queue itself. You would just like as if you had submitted the patch, would show up as a change in the issue. Um, so, yeah, on Drupal.org, the issue queue would create the comments and notify everyone that's following the issue, hey, someone, pa someone pushed a new change to this issue. So everyone involved would be able to see that that, that had actually changed. And then the one thing where this kind of makes things a little bit iffy is right now when we submit a patch, there is all the explanation that goes with that patch can be typed up in the same issue. We attach a patch to the comment. 
In this case, you're pushing up and you've got your commit message, but it, there's not really an easy way to afford a richer, like, here's my description of the change that I'm trying to make, because you might want to have bullet points and all the nice, you know, HTML formatting and stuff. So you might have to go back to the issue queue after you push something major and do your explanation as another comment. So, um, so to kind of describe like how this would look, this is a real issue that happened one seven four zero four nine two, and I just I just picked one arbitrarily to kind of show what would happen. Um, so. Dominer would create an issue workspace. He was the first one to open this issue and post the first patch. So he would create this issue workspace, clone it, and then push the change on his branch to the workspace. XGM saw that patch and said, this looks good, except there's some text cleanup that needs to happen. And so she, in this issue, actually posted another patch with the text cleanup. But in this case, she'd be able to use the inline editor and just do the text cleanup right in line. And then he says, oh, oh, cool, thanks. And he pulls her changes, does some more work, and he had actually posted three more patches to comment 18, 19, and 20, and so three more commits, pushes those up. And then it sat for a while, no one addressed it, no one reviewed what was going on, and it needed a re-roll. And so in this case, he would just be merging ahead back into his, his branch, so that instead of re-rolling, he's just like, well, does this still apply? And then the person that's working on it in their branch would have the ability to resolve conflicts right at that point. So they would be able to know that like, oh, okay, there was a change in head that broke what I was working on. Easy for them to know. I should have put a commit in there on head that showed that. And so Damien comes along and says, hey, uh, I want to work on this too. And he says, there's uh, on every commit in the issue queue, there would be an, uh, a work from this point URL. So he could say, okay, well, I want to clone this workspace, but I want to work from where Dominer's at. So he would clone that and it would start him there and he would be able to make his commit merge in head because he had actually also done a reroll and then he'd be able to push that up and then he makes some more fixes and this is actually again what happened in the issue 35, 36. He said oh yeah those are good fixes I'll take those back and keep working on it and so they're able to merge back and forth between each other. Now Dostro came along created a branch based off of where Dominer was at and was like hey I've got some ideas and then he made another commit, and then a long time passed, and no one addressed this for a long time. And then when Dominer finally came back, he was like, ah, I see what you're doing, but a lot of stuff has changed since then. I'm not going to use your changes. I'm going to roll this off of the patch that I already had. And so he doesn't have to merge in those changes if someone else is working on an issue that's like, that's not the direction we necessarily want to take. So he was able to pull that in. And then Jennifer Hodgson came along and said, hey, we've got to document this. And so she submitted a documentation patch, but that could also be an inline edit. Like, let's just add the documentation around the, the code that we want to document. Finally, he said, oh, yeah, totally. We need to document that. And from 74 to 128, he was patching and merging head in and re-rolling and patching and merging head in. Finally, at 128, it was RTBC. And the last commit, Alex could take that, took that commit and committed it. And in this case, we now have all this Git history here. We've got all, everyone who's worked on the issue in Git. We could choose to keep that, but I think in contrib that might be really valuable to say, oh, these five things happened, let's just move that in. But in core we might do something like the Linux kernel does, which is merge, do a squash merge everything and put one commit in there and say issue number 174092 worked on by Dominer, XGM, and Damien, you know be able to commit that as one whole thing. This would still be in the repository. We'd still have access to see what changes they were. Reviewing this, we could see each, each granular commit. We'd be able to see inner diffs between each of these things easily because we could just use Git to say, what's the difference between those two? Show me. So that is kind of it in a nutshell. This is just a kind of another demonstration with the kind of swim lanes there showing the lines between the branches and who's got permission to commit to them. And so, yeah, I mean, each person can only commit into their own spot and can choose to merge from others, but they don't have to. And there's nothing stopping anybody from saying, well, let's just create another branch and we'll, we'll just work there because that might be easier for this particular thing. I'll push, you push, I'll push, you push. It might be one person's working on documentation, another person's working on the 
on the code itself. That might just be faster and easier than doing a bunch of merges back and forth. So that would be an option too. Additionally, you could probably, I haven't fully thought this through, but you could add additional branches that you only had access to because the branches are going to be restricted by your username and the issue number. So we could add more of those if need be. So the legacy patch based workflow, what happens? Well, we don't want it to go away. We don't, we don't want to say, all right, everybody, now you're all using Git. Because some people are going to be like, well, I'm kind of fine with patches. What was wrong with that? And we don't want to force anybody into moving to something new that they didn't want. So we want to keep it and all the tools working the way they, that they currently do. So you could still upload and download and apply patches. And any and anytime someone does that, it would create a commit behind the scenes. Additionally, whenever someone creates pushes a change with Git, on the issue itself, there would be a link for the patch that you could download of that change. And so tools like Dreaditor and other things that are used to seeing that there's a patch in line would still work. They would still be able to review that patch. People who are used to using tools to, for that would um, would be able to interact with the issue queues in the same way. And what that also gives us is it allows us to minimize disruption. It allows us to implement this feature and roll it out and beta that feature. It allows us to say, hey, you three want to try this and tell us what we've missed on this or tell us what's broken on it. So instead of being like, here's the whole new thing, who likes it, who hates it, we can be like, hey, hey, try this out. Let's let's work out the kinks. Let's move forward and get, make this really nice and we can still keep our patch-based workflow. And then in, inline editing, so simplifying these complex things, we want to be able to make it so that you can edit progress that's in work. This isn't intended to be browse the code base, pick on a file, and start start developing. It's not. We're not trying to build an online IDE. We're just trying to reduce the amount of effort it takes for someone to make a small change in the midst of a code change. A quick clarifying question: What if you want to make a change to reading the text? Could you still leave it You might need someone to start it in Git or upload a patch because the the thing that we don't have from the gate from the get go, and this is this is like where we're going to start with. You know, we can always iterate and add this, but the the initial thing is, well, how would they select which file to work on? Where does that interface live? Where do they? Right now, the only way we can browse our Git repositories is in the C Git repository, which isn't Drupal, which doesn't give us an API that we can say this file I want to edit it, and so that's something else we're also you know would like to look at is like. Just in order to clarify, so it would be only changing what was being edited previously, so kind of editing a patch. Yeah, it would allow you to edit a patch that's already in progress. But it, the context would be the file that's being changed, not the context of the patch, right? Right. And so when they edit it, it would also create a commit in the workspace on that. whoever the Whatever user that is that's making the edit, it would create them a branch behind the scenes, it would add their commit to it, and it would be just as if they had made the change in Git behind the scenes so that people using Git would see that change how they're used to seeing it. People, it would also create the patch on the, because every time a commit goes, the patch would go on the issue. So it kind of translates between all three systems or all three ways of working. Um, and then, yeah, the, the goal is it's not for editing everything yet. Maybe we can add that in. Maybe we can get an interface to where people can say, I want to fix that readme file and they can change the readme file. But right now, that's not in scope, basically. Michael has a question. <laughs> Are you taking questions or trying to um, Sort of, yeah. So, on, on, on this specific thing, or? Well, on that, well, I mean, it's a larger point than just that, but it encompasses that. So if you want to finish, I can go back. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I'll, I'm, I'm getting close, so. And then the code review tools. Right now, we want better code review. This doesn't necessarily solve it, but it doesn't break what we already have. We can still use Redditor because the patches will still be there. We can still comment on lines of code. So until we have time to maybe pull out the best part of Fabricator and say, hey, here's a nice code review tool we can embed inside of Drupal.org, or here's a nice piece of open source software that allows us to do this without reinventing everything and building our own again. Um, yeah, the, so it would use existing tools. We would still be able to create interchange diffs fairly easily. We could say this patch and that patch, what what changed between those two. So inner diffs no longer need to be something that's uploaded separately. It could be something we have in the interface that says, show me the differences between these two things. 
I think that would be something that would be able to do out of the gates. Plus, the reviews would be more granular. We'd see each commit and the change that happened in that commit. With the interchange diffs, we could say, show me what happened in this issue, show me what happened between this and the last change. So those are options that we would have for code review. And then once we want to merge the changes upstream, the maintainers could use a button in the issue queues and say, just, just like on GitHub, where they're like, yeah, go ahead and merge that change. We can do the same thing. We can add a button that says, this is good to go. It's RTBC. Everybody's happy with it. Push. And it would merge it in and commit it to the production branch. Or they could do that with Git. They could do the same thing. Like, it, again, whatever tool people are used to working in, if they want to work from the web interface or if they want to work from Git, they would be able to merge these changes upstream. So what would this do for our uh, velocity acceleration? We'd be able to use Git to reveal these issue conflicts. Right now, our version control database has kind of an insane level of detail, like the each file and each line number in each file that is affected by a patch is being tracked currently. We already have all that data, so we can say, okay, this issue is touching these five files. Which other issues have these files in them? Let's do a merge between those two and see if there's a problem. So we could be able to detect, like, this issue and that issue. If we commit them both, they're going to break. So we can offer an interface that says, this issue is going to cause problems with these five other issues. Revealing things like, oh, this is intra-issue conflict, and um, additionally revealing things like duplicates. duplicates. Yes, that's, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Um, it would reduce the need for disruptive patch windows, like, oh, if we make this change, everything else grinds to a halt. Let's do it at the right time. So we can kind of relieve some project management burden there. Um, and then when someone does make a commit on production and says, okay, here's here or on head, head moves forward, and that that commit broke some other um, some other issue in the queue. And the person moving in is like, yeah, I know it's going to break it. We're not worried about that. But the person who was worried about that issue would immediately get a notification. They would know right then that like, hey, this code that you took time to like commit and add to the workflow, you would know right away that like, hey, it's out, of, it's stale. Do you want to do something about it? And um, I, I told a, a friend, uh, Jonathan Hedstrom, about how many needs review issues were just floating around for just years in the queue. And he said he went through and he just started trying to apply the patches and say re-roll, needs re-roll, and doing that. And he, he was like, people would just come out of the woodwork and just start fixing their things because they knew about it. But for now, they don't know about when needs review breaks. Oh, oh, we can. What this does is we've already got the intra, um, well, yeah, because, yeah, it simplifies that process and it also makes it so that we don't need to um, run a test to see whether it doesn't apply, yeah. right? Because that's all we're really trying to say is this no longer applies. We want to let you know right now that it no longer applies. And, and yes, we, we, we could solve this another way, like just without even any changing any of this. It makes it easier to re-roll a patch once done. Yeah. I guess my question is, we have this current Git system that was custom built for us and has had a history of absolutely horrible security issues. Has it? Yeah. And so why is the, you know, there's some instances where Drupal needs to build tools for its use, and there's some instances where we should build on APIs and other services provide. So, you know, I'm seeing this and I'm looking, I'm thinking in my head, there's an enormous amount of code, there's an enormous amount of infrastructure work, and there's probably other tools on the self-hosted plan where we can integrate with their APIs as opposed to building something and then having to maintain it indefinitely ourselves. Well, it's the just integrate with their APIs part that is is actually a lot larger than it sounds. Um, but it's infinitesimally smaller than building the entire system but we've already got the system built. This is just a proposal to push it forward a few steps. And, and I'm not aware of the security issues with the, the Git system. Like, I'm not... I, I share those. Yeah, that, that would be... Um, I'm, but yeah. the... Um, I mean, they've been patched at this point. But the... But I, I don't know why we're continuing... Like, if there's... Like, the D8 mantra. We, we build our own tools, and now we're going to kind of jump off that island and embrace Symfony, embrace other tools. Well, there's embracing other tools, and then there's embracing other services. And so 
when all of our code is dependent upon some other business's business model and business decisions, that, that binds us to something. That, that ties us to something that, you know, using, using Symfony doesn't tie us to that. Like, it's another open source project. We're not necessarily paying them to use their code. But, or even signing an agreement that says, sure, we, we'll get it for free. I'm thinking more along the analysis of, like, using Jenkins. Tools does the job. There are other tools. We could have built our own task runner tool. We had one, actually, for a while. We chose a product that's open source that we're using. There's other open source projects that we could either add APIs into and rely on them to do things like make sure that, you know, we're not the only set of eyes running it. Because does the DA, with the current staffing level of 11 people, really want to continue to run its own get data? I mean, that's, that's a fair question. I and mean, it's... It's, um, there was an issue with the Git daemon recently where basically the way that authentication was happening was causing, causing people to get denied access. And, you know, Alex and um, Webchip can definitely uh, attest to the number of times you had to push and was like, why did it break? I'll just push again. And the only person who really knew how that software worked was Sam. Boyer. And I was able to sit with him for a few hours and we went through the code and we dug into it. So now I know it too. But that is a good point. Like, what do we want to run our own Git daemon? Do we want to have our own Git service? And is there an alternative to that? Or is, do we want to run, do we want to, want to run our own custom built Git daemon versus another Git daemon that we could implement? I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. I'm just saying right. that we should really, we should ask that question and investigate, you know, if we took one of the off the shelf Git daemons that are open source or even paid, how much work is it really to make it work on our system? Keep in mind that we've got the craziest access permission system. Like, the way we do access permissions on projects is not something that applies to all other projects. Right. So it wouldn't be necessarily, it may be more work to actually adapt a third party system. And, and some of the things that I've seen is most of the third party systems haven't even delved in to get namespaces. And they haven't, they don't have that feature. Like, I looked at a few of them and it's like, well, we could use this, but they don't have this thing we want to do here. So that was that was another issue, but I mean maybe there are ones that are implementing it now, or maybe we could put in feature requests. So or maybe we implement it and help them get to move their project forward to help us at the same time. Right. And then lots of people may say it's possible. Yeah. Well and we've we've had trouble finding even the Git repository viewer, no interactive I'm aware that I I can't scale to our number of repositories. So yeah, so we have to yeah, and, and and the Git daemon itself isn't necessarily a part of how this workflow works. It's just it's just a piece that sure. ideally should be transparent to everybody. Like you should be able to connect to the Git daemon and it should be able to inter interface with the permissioning and architecture. But this wouldn't necessarily preclude or exclude using somebody else's Git daemon to handle that. Would it be safe to say that this is mostly about how our Git interacts with our issues? Yes more than anything else. And, and that's the one thing that, that wherever we look at, like, uh, what does integration look like? It's the fact that we have, how many issues? No, we have issues. We have issues. We have one. We have issues. Oh, that's fine. But, uh, yeah, no, I understand. Uh, please. But, like, people have editors, web browser, coming. that actually get reposed, scare the shit out of me. No, that's you, like, that's scary. Like, I know GitHub does it. I know it's easy to use on GitHub. Us implementing that ourselves, like, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of resources we need to protect, and we have to, I mean, some of it we do, we have implemented ourselves, you know, like, sure. we have our own single sign-on, we have our own, you know, variety of different things that, Sure, but I know. think everybody involved with Bakery doesn't like it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely not picking on you. Right. Yeah. Um, we did a decent job of running the Git daemon of zero people for a couple of years. <laughs> Didn't explode too much. Yeah. So I, I've only got like two more slides, so let me just finish those and then I'll, we'll just move right into questions and discussion. So next step is collect feedback. You know, we, we've been reluctant to open an issue and start on this bef because... I've been busy with a lot of other things, and I haven't been able to respond to some of these ideas. You know, and so now there's an issue. Now we're going to start talking about it. Now let's like go through. I mean, you know, I want to link in everything that's already been talked about. Link in all the different, uh, you know, 
spreadsheets that have happened that show like we thought about this and we thought about that so that you know we don't have to rehash some of the same arguments. Um, and if this if, if the feedback is yeah let's move forward then we would implement the backend changes and this might be Michael where we find a better git daemon because you know honestly I don't know that I want to get into this twisted Python script and refigure that out again in this asynchronous Python code that I somewhat understand from a two hour code review. Um, then we would, uh, you know, and this, this would be implementing the git namespaces and making all the access control and everything else work on the back end. And then we design and implement the UI elements, offer a beta test, get some people involved to say, hey, let's try this. Does this work? Are we crazy? Does this actually help anything? And then finally we'd launch it if it's solid and everyone's happy. So I do want to point out that, yeah, standing on the shoulders of giants, all of this code was written by other people. There's so much stuff in there and there's so many things that these are a lot of the names that showed up in all of the issue, um, all of the version, all of the repositories that hold all the stuff for the version control and version control get and project module and things like that. So these were just some of the people that like have, have helped me, have described how this stuff really works. So just want to say thanks to those folks. And finally, there's some details about me, Tatiana here. If you have questions, the you know, product manager, my details. I'm on IRC all the time. I'm on Drupal.org. I work for the Drupal Association, so I am available. We want to produce a product that you're happy with. Um, yeah, let us know what you thought. Um, but let's take more questions. You guys, what do you think? Like, what do you have ideas? Or are you like, ooh, that's not going to work? Or, or Damien's getting up right now, so I'll let you. Just so they're recorded, I guess. Yes. Um, Simple question I may have missed, but given the current workload that you have already for other projects and the amount of work you're estimating this to be, when do you think you'd have something launchable? I mean, honestly, I feel like the amount of change that are required and the amount of... It's more adding tests to make sure everything works that would take the longest. I'm, I feel pretty confident that we could have something maybe beta-able by Barcelona. Depending on how many fires there are, depending on how many times the test bots fall over randomly, or depending on you know those sorts of things, because we're managing working on a product versus maintaining issues that happen. You know, we're kind of dual role of support and product creation. So, so you're saying that you've got um, functional prototype, or even possibly fully working code that just needs bulletproofing and further testing. Well, no, the, as far as the changes that need to take place, they're actually kind of minimal. Like on the Git daemon side, we just need to implement the namespaces feature on Git, which is, it's already baked into Git. It just means that when someone authenticates at the Git daemon, we need to make it so that it understands that they're asking for a branch on an issue namespace and just make the translation between Git clone issue number to dash dash issue namespace drupal.org dot get. Um, I've got some, I've actually got some backup slides here of kind of how it works on the deeper back end. Um, but yeah, um, did I answer your question? I mean, does that? Yeah, that helps. Yeah, it's hard to know exactly how long anything's going to take, you know, when's Drupal 8 coming out? <laughs> <laughs> First off, I'm really excited about what you're showing us. Like, I think the idea of collaborating on branches like, mirrors the way that most people work on Drupal itself. So it's really exciting to see that happening in the issue. I'm cautious of over-egging like, the disruptive issue thing, because if you take the example that you used as the PHP issue, it wasn't that the patch was big, they didn't get committed. It was that at the point in the release cycle it was, we didn't want to have to change all the documentation and all the, the, the things that surround the issue. So it's, <coughs> we, we was was that just for Drupal 8, you mean? Or yeah. for 5, 6, 7, well, and 8? <laughs> what everyone's used to, like a module file coming with a dot module, we've, we've told people that for ages. And also it's not, whatever, I'm not going to go into that issue, but like... Right, so that particular issue, issue might not have been... It just the, the disruption to the existing queue um, that was 
important. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the subject of like validating patches and giving the feedback, that would be excellent. Like about a year and a half ago, I wrote uh, some tools that I like, processed the RGBC juices. And when I did a commit, I did automatically apply all the patches that were in the RGBC juice and knock them back to the means work in the rerun. That like increased velocity and load. So if we have that happening automatically, <coughs> it would be brilliant. Um, I'm really excited. Cool. If I kind of share his enthusiasm and excitement for kind of what you presented here, uh, three of my passions are Git tooling and Drupal. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, how can I help? I, I've heard a lot of things saying, like, you've got 11 in house people that can work on this. Uh, is this in the open or is this? You know, where can I go to help? <laughs> um, yeah, it is now. We're, you know, we're, it, we haven't wanted to ask for help until now because we haven't been able to necessarily know what to do with it yet. You know, we haven't had a plan in place. So I think it'll be, you know, there will be the public discussion and we'll come up with a plan and then we could definitely like start segment, segmenting tasks and have things that like, here's how you can help. But um, I don't know that we have that outlined yet specifically, um, but we welcome it. So. Yeah. On the UI side and the issue queues, Go back to which one? Uh, oh, would yeah. it be possible to have like a function call that kind of abstracts away all the stuff happening on the back end? So like if later we decided we wanted to switch all the get stuff to a different hosting provider or internally host a service, that it would just be literally changing like four or five functions for how to enter this and how to read that stuff. Is that a possibility to do in the UI now when we do that? Or? Um, I'm, I'm sure we could put a facade in between where we get our data and how that... But basically, you're, you're suggesting we have a layer in between that the issue queue works with an API and then that API connects with either our back end or some other back end. And I, I mean, that's a great idea. That should be a way we can engineer it. The, Version control system itself is engineered such that we could switch over to Bazaar tomorrow if we wanted to. Um, <laughs> just, it's just, it's flexible. So, you know, so yeah, I mean, adding that sort of flexibility might be a really good future proofing if we come to the realization that, you know, GitHub adds new features to change the way that you manage issue queues and it would actually work for us. So that's, yeah. Remembered my other thing. Um, it's kind of just like echoing Michael's concern about security. Um, during the AAA cycle, there was a moment when everyone in maintainers.pex could push to the A.X branch. And <laughs> like if, we, if we're using main spaces, which means that everyone's going to be able to push to the A.X repository, we're going to have to test that. About that. Yes. Um, it, it, it's interesting because if you submit a pull request, right now to any project on GitHub, you are committing code to their repository. That that data is there. You can um, you can do git clone dash dash mirror and it will mirror the entire repository down. And in in the deep end here, um, here's my mouse pointer. There'll be on GitHubs it has refs, heads, tags, and there's another one called pulls. And that's actually the pull request and the code that somebody submitted to your repository. So it's one of those things where what if they can push to core but they can't push to the A.X branch? That's that's really the the security level that we want to keep. We want to keep it so that they can't push to the branch that matters. But just like on GitHub, a pull request like it's in the repository but it doesn't merge into the thing that counts. So just just from history like Yes. And like, as you know, like when that happened, like it required like an emergency call to Sam. To unpull. What about the Sparkle patch that happened recently? Uh, Gerhard's. He had committed oh, no, something and right, reverted. Yeah. Oh, no, that's yeah. different. Yeah, he that's different. Had oh, he was supposed like, to. Got it. Yeah. Okay, if, if you're a Drupal 4.6 maintainer. 4.7. Yeah, 4.7. <laughs> um, so I have a question. The whole talk was you come to the issue with work to be done and work to be submitted because you have an idea. Drupal is very developer-oriented. 
issue too, and I like this because I it works great for developer flow, but what about the user that's submitting a feature request for a bug report? Like take Drupal Commons, for example. My God, all those issues are nothing but just doesn't work. I don't know how to do this. It's site builders that have issues. Is it going to be just as easy for them to create an issue workspace and then let's say I'm an issue too, and then hop on it and continue working with it? Because I just, all the use cases were brought on, like a developer submitting a patch and then running with it. What about when it's non developers creating the issues? Well, the creating a workspace wouldn't necessarily be something that's automatically tied to an issue. It would be a button that someone could say, create me a workspace, I'm going to start adding code to this. So in those situations, like, people would be, still be able to comment and they would still be, I mean, I, I don't know how else they would work on the issue besides respond to what's going on. And so the issue would still have all of its information in there. So they would be able to create issues and, but. And there would, like, be a link where I could then grab that and, like, work on that and then my branch would show up in the reps. Yes, yes, yeah. Um. Somewhat related to the point Alex brought up, um, can you speak to any thoughts on getting rid of commits or branches or with namespaces where somebody adds something either problematic content or say something that is uh, that breaks the licensing agreements and stuff? Sure. Um, right now, I mean, the way that the Git daemon is set up is it ban it forbids force pushes. It doesn't allow people to do a force push to remove something. And so there's a workaround for that where you make another branch and then you delete, you move everything over to that branch and you delete the branch that was on there and push that and it'll delete the branch remotely. So that actually works. But um, I don't know that we're addressing that with this, but it is something we should be able to have in our, as a, as a thing to address if people are going to be using Git more often to push stuff as opposed to patches. Because then you're right, you know, a patch file, somebody submits a patch file, and I just deleted one of these the other day, where it's like, hey, that patch file actually had a password in it, can you kill it? And so we just deleted the patch file off the system, and it was gone. But putting it in Git requires a little bit more effort to make it gone, so um, that's something we should definitely consider. Okay. Add that so in. have you specifically thought about removing the block of uh, force pushes, force um, not not specifically because um, uh, I don't know what I don't know why it was there in the first place so I'm sure there was a reason for it so I'd like to find out why that was there to find out what were we trying to stop and well I mean uh, what what is what is removing that enable it's Which maybe we could add force pushes to individual namespace branches because no one else should be cloning your branch. Oh no, it would still break it because they would be able to pull from it. Yeah. Well, oh, she's got a whole laptop full of questions. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so I've been live tweeting your thing the whole time. No. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to relay some comments from Twitter. Ooh. <laughs> um, so the Twitters say. Uh, there's a vague sidebar discussion about why are we moving to GitHub, which you would expect. But I guess what I would recommend is when you do a big blog post about the half fact that this is happening, really dig in on that. Um, and I've seen you elucidate this many times that you understand all the issues with the collaboration, but maybe some kind of an illustration showing the fragmentation issue that you're worried about, because I think people are so used to the way GitHub works, they literally do not understand what is valuable about our collaboration model and why that's important. Right, which which goes back to his point. Like, I'm a, I've got an issue in commerce. Where would I go to report? Like, hey, I've got a problem. And is that an issue on GitHub? And would they be able to find it? And would they know where to comment? And yeah, it's a complete mess. But I think you just need to be able to uh, explain that because I think a lot of people are having a knee jerk reaction, which is why are we spending Drupal dollars money on this? We could just be moving to GitHub. It sounds easy, but I think <laughs> just, when yeah. you explain this to people, just be, you know. Mm -hmm. um, another question, and I brought this up the last time I saw this, is, um, you know, there's a big emphasis on these individual branches um, and people pulling and pushing and stuff from each other's branches, but the way that we're set up and part of the heart of our collaboration model is this, is this swarm effect mm -hmm. where we all just work in the same place. Um, so it is still confusing to me that that is not the default 
and that G Dasho, who wants to do something weird, can make his own personal branch off of the main one, but why we make it a lot more complicated for people who just want to work with each other. It's a little bit well, confusing that that's still what we're planning to do. Well, we're not necessarily removing the ability to do that. I know, but this seems like you're still pushing this as the default model, and I think this is really hard well, to explain to people who are used to lay patches with. It might be, but this is the swarm. The only reason that there's these different lanes is that it makes it so that people can't step on each other's changes. Because right now, if I come to an issue and I see a patch on that issue, I don't have to pull that patch down and change my working space. I don't. I, I can choose not to. My working space is my own, and nobody else is able to affect that. If everyone that's not how we work. Well, the way we work is messy, but it's like uh, you just take whatever the latest patch is, you would hack at it. If someone else is hacking at the same time, oops, you conflict. But 90% of the time, that isn't what happens. So anyway, it's just food for thought. Chicks brought it up as well, so I figured, yeah, that's not just me. I'm not crazy. But anyway, um, the last one was, oh, uh, this was one for me. Um, I'm really, I'm really concerned a little bit that we're so focused on Git namespaces and how this is an awesome technology and we can get this all figured out from the back of the very last slide, right? Or oh, yes. This? Uh, sorry, that one that you just had with the link on. This one. Yep. So you're saying we're first going to collect feedback. Absolutely awesome. That's great. All Although right. I would caution you to have a really good explanation for why not GitHub before you, you know, really push that on people. But you're talking about implementing the backend changes first and then designing the UI elements for people to organize think that that backwards. Or at least those two things should be happening in parallel because it makes a really big difference to our, like, you're, you're talking about changing the way we work. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important how that UI works. And I think the way the UI works is going to inform some of the backend changes. So I would, I would deeply request that those two things are tackled alongside each other and not Otherwise, what's going to happen, I fear, is we're going to get stuck with the UI that mirrors how Git works, and Git was never intended for anyone other than Linus right. to make any sense of. So just right, and, I, <laughs> and, and this, to be fair, this slide isn't real clear when I'm talking about backend changes. I was talking about the low level, right at the the point where Git allows people in the door and gives them authentication. But I hadn't gone as far as how the UI actually integrates with that backend. So. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So there's there's kind of two back ends to this, and and you're right. That other back end needs to come after we design and implement the UI elements. But this this was one that like I could provide a proof of concept and not change anything anywhere else as far as just does namespaces work? Will it scale? Like maybe it's maybe this is you know it's a new enough technology that no one's leveraged this way that it breaks everything and it's like oh okay, it's really slow there for some reason. I I'm not sure so. Probably shouldn't. It's C, right? It'll just leak memory. <laughs> um, you want to hit the microphone? Sorry, just since. So I can't guarantee anything on this, but one of our essays, I believe, is the uh, package maintainer for Git uh, for Debian. Mm. He's super, like, he blows my mind. I can try to like paint him and see if he has an info on his performance stuff. Then send it to me because that I don't, would that be really useful? Like, if he has some yeah, um, I actually went into the Git, um, the blame log for this issue in Git and found the guy who committed it, and he works at Intel in Portland, and I've been following him on Twitter and kind of liking his things and getting to the point where I can be like, hey, can I ask you a question? You know, so, but yes, yeah, any any questions and help on things like this, like, that would be great. Anybody else? Well, hey, I think that concludes this session. Um.